The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, today we're going to pick up our conversation that we started a couple of weeks ago when we had Walter Rigu on to talk about the impact on China-Africa trade that the COVID-19 or the novel coronavirus crisis is having on the China-Africa economic relationship. I think what he said, which was so important to kind of point out, is that this is actually less a health crisis and more of an economic crisis at this point, particularly for Africa, because we're not seeing the health consequences right now, Cobus, in Africa, but we are starting to see very severe economic aftershocks that are starting to be felt across the continent. So we're talking about reductions in aviation, which means a reduction in trade. Uh, shipping has come to a halt in many respects. Investment is slowing down. The Chinese economy also is now going into this retreat, if you will, as all of the country's resources are being kind of turned inwards to help kind of put on, on, as Xi Jinping said, this war footing that China now has in terms of battling coronavirus. And Africa has always been highly exposed to severe fluctuations in the global economy, given the fact that it's a large exporter of raw materials and commodities. It doesn't have a lot of value add to the products it uh, produces. So, Cobus, we are now starting to see those effects. It's a little bit scary because the shock absorbers in Africa in economies are just not there. And this wasn't anticipated 10 to 15 years ago that 40 to 41 countries that now have their largest trading partnership with China would be exposed to a dramatic slowdown in the Chinese economy like this. Yes, so we're seeing commodity prices sliding, um, oil is down, copper is down, and certain African economies are particularly exposed. So, you know, Zambia is one, um, Republic of Congo, Congo Brazzaville is another one. Um, and, you know, it's increasingly, it is also raising questions about uh, the repayment of resource-backed loans, um, because we've seen um, African countries that, that have loans with China that they're supposed to be repaying paying with raw resources end up having to repay a lot more when those prices go down. So countries like Nigeria and Angola, you know, there's suddenly kind of questions being asked about, about that, those repayments. So in our conversation with Walter, we got the micro view, what it's like on the ground, how the ports are working, how the trade is actually the functioning part of trade. If you didn't get to hear that episode, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. Today, we're going to look at the macro picture, the big picture and the economics in China and how that is going to affect Africa. And we are thrilled to have back on the show. It's been a while, but Jeremy Stevens, who is the chief China economist for Standard Bank, Standard Bank, of course, being one of Africa's largest banks, he joins us on the line from Sanya, beautiful Sanya, where he is in quarantine in paradise. A very good afternoon to you, Jeremy. Good afternoon, Eric. Good afternoon, Kobus. Uh, yeah, I'm delighted to participate. And you're right, I'm in Sanya. I'm in sort of a lockdown. It's really kicked off uh, last week. Uh, they issued us with a pink slip, and that basically allows one person from each household to leave. Uh, and I think this is the sort of last push uh, by uh, the administration here to uh, sort of arrest the rising infection rates of this coronavirus. And, you know, outside of Hubei province, it pretty much shows uh, that a lot of these measures have started to yield dividends. We see today uh, the infection new cases outside of Hubei province were just 70. Um, so I do think we're pretty close to at least outside Hubei province, uh, declaring some kind of uh, victory in arresting the, this coronavirus. Um, so in many respects, I think the, the, the illness uh, and the health crisis has largely been averted inside China. Um, but of course, when the World Health Organization declared uh, 
um, an international emergency, they were pretty pretty clear when they said, you know, this is not about what's happening inside China, but this is what's happening. This is about what's happening in the rest of the world. And so I'm still watching um, certain provinces in China carefully to see if there's more pockets of outbreaks. And I'm certainly watching the with with keen interest what's happening on the ground in Africa. Um, because of course the flow of people between China and Africa has surged in the last couple of years, and the worry is that you know Africa's health infrastructure isn't necessarily well equipped to deal with this kind of outbreak. Um, the fact that you know you, when you have you, w- when you don't have symptoms, you can still be contagious for you know around about two weeks. Um, it it really is about uh, you know surveillance and checking fevers and making sure your infrastructure is being proactive in fighting this virus. Yeah, let's use your experience now that you are in Hainan uh, province, Hainan Island, which is all the way down. You're close to me across from Vietnam. That's how far away you are from from China itself, and yet you are under a quarantine. Uh, most of China is under quarantine. My Chinese teacher up in Xi'an, v- again, very far away from, from Hubei, is under a quarantine. They can't, or lockdown, quarantine is not the right word, but you're locked in your homes. Now, what this means for Africa is the fact that people are not going to work. People are not buying stuff. Uh, trade is not happening. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the effects of the slowdown that's happened post Chinese New Year and what that implies for the future of Africa's economic relationship with China that has become so dependent on the China market now. Well, yeah, I mean, so I've been spending a lot of time talking to clients about this as well in the last couple of weeks. You know, the reality is right now, economic activity in China is basically at a standstill. Um, And the reality is the economy will be playing catch up uh, throughout the rest of the year. Um, You know, at this juncture, in my opinion, GDP growth is likely to slip, you know, somewhere between four and a half and five percent for the year, um, which is, you know, materially lower than currently anticipated. Most people and most analysts looking at China sort of see it in a sort of SARS lens, where they think there'll be a, a, a deterioration in Q1 and then a sharpish rebound in Q2, and then some kind of stabilisation. And and the, I think it's a bit naive to to think in the, in that way. Um, you know, if you pencil in a, a totally plausible scenario of flat growth in manufacturing and construction in Q1, um, you would see GDP for the full year decline in China by 75 basis points. If you add services like catering, wholesale trade, retail trade, real estate, transport, you know, just flat growth, so exactly the same as what they posted in Q1 of last year, that will reduce what GDP would have been by 1.5%. So you're looking at cl- somewhere close to one and a half percentage points full year uh, slower in GDP. And and my, my belief is that the recovery is going to be significantly shallower than uh, many people are sort of thinking. And the reality is that's because China's got structural headwinds that, that are still entrenched. I mean, the policy response to date has obviously been focused on making sure financial markets are, you know, sufficiently uh, lubricated with liquidity, uh, prevent, you know, interbank rates from spiking, make sure the chain of liquidity continues to function, ensure that banks are lending to uh, those that are supporting the coronavirus effort or businesses that are, you know, uh, struggling as a result of coronavirus. Um, that's great. But the idea that, you know, you're going to see you know, for example, real esta- real, uh, retail sales rebound like they may have done after SARS of 2003, just highly unlikely when you consider that the amount of debt that households have taken on over the last couple of years, particularly mortgage-related be- uh, debt, and then you sort of overlay that with what was already a, a sort of um, a, a lowering of expectations around future growth in China, lowering expectations around your future income, lowering expectations around employment. You know, those, those factors were well entrenched long before the coronavirus hit, and that's been made significantly worse by the coronavirus. The same sort of stress uh, that manufacturer, the manufacturing sector was under last year, which saw you know, investment by the manufacturing sector declined to 3% year on year. Um, you know, the last 18 months has really been all about uh, how can the government encourage financial institutions to make sure that small and medium enterprises have access to liquidity as they battle through um, the impact of the trade war, 
and you know slowing demand inside the Chinese economy. Now, even if you make sure that these these companies are relatively able to access capital, a lot of them are small entrepreneurs that uh, are you know spending the next month. Uh, paying salaries for businesses, even though the 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 business isn't back to operations, uh, it does potentially mean that some of these entrepreneurs may have to start considering selling assets. Those assets are likely to be real estate. Um, I saw uh, Tsinghua University and Peking University released a survey that said 30% of the SMEs that they surveyed. Uh, wouldn't last longer than a month on current cash flows. Another thirty percent of them said they wouldn't last another two months on current cash flows. So there's a lot of stress in the system, and th- the problem is that that even if you, even if you can avoid significant um, defaults in in this sector and the real estate sector, and you can sort of have some kind of a rebound in consumption, the reality is a lot of the risk sits now on banks' balance sheets. That was already the case last year. We've known for the last three years that the financial regulators have been clamping down and trying to de-risk the financial system. Obviously, this coronavirus means that that's going to be paused comprehensively. Um, I think that was the sort of main finding from the outbreak of this coronavirus was it, it fundamentally altered the uh, policy tilt of the leadership inside China and. As a result, you're probably going to see more Kindle added to the potential, you know, um, difficulties that that the financial system's under. How do you for, how do you forecast this impacts Africa? So all of this is happening in China: the slowdown, the lack of of resources to sustain a long term decline, and what are going to be the impacts on trade and the macro impacts on on Africa? Well, first and foremost, you know, the biggest risk is should coronavirus uh, reach Africa. Uh, that would change everything fundamentally. But based on the assumption that Africa is able to avoid uh, that, um, you know, the the biggest hit already has been the impact on global sentiment. So we started this year relatively um, optimistic. Uh, the global economy was talking about a rebound in manufacturing. Global growth was expected to accelerate. This was crystallized in mid-January with the inking of the phase one of the trade deal, and and. Clearly, things have taken quite a sharp turn for the worst since then. Um, financial markets, as Kuv has mentioned in the introduction, you know, have already started to adjust and reprice assets. Um, port closures and restrictions in China have caused some commodity importers, uh, you know, to cancel purchases. Uh, we do expect um, relatively soft demand out of China uh, from this cyclical impact, but also structurally. I mean, uh, Africa's. Exports to China, I think, increased by, f- f- contracted by four percent last year. They're still way below 2013 peaks. That's a structural issue as China's investment, uh, building roads, bridges, and ports is is topping out. Um, so we're closer to that point. Um, even before the survey data and this macroeconomic impact is seen in the data, um, many of the emerging market central banks have already started to cut interest rates. Um, that narrowing in the in the rate differential puts pressure on um, Africa's currencies. Um, potentially, Africa's um, government bond yields will react to that. That's problematic. We know that many African countries have accumulated significant amounts of uh, debt in the recent years, and I think it's 60 billion in euro bond issuance over the last two years. So rate changes there obviously hurt. Um, so it's a headwind for Africa's asset prices and for its markets, of course. And then. Uh, Always, the the biggest impact is felt, and the first impact always felt by the the countries that are most reliant on commodities, uh, and as you know, many African countries are heavily reliant on on commodities. So their terms of trade plus their demand uh, could be impacted, and that hurts, um, you know, materially some African economies. Uh, you know, there's risk for projects in 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 Chinese owned pro- projects in Africa to be delayed. Uh, not just the flow of people that might be limited in the next couple of weeks and months, but you know the flow of goods is for the supply chains break down. Um, you've got problems of maybe getting equipment and certain key inputs uh, that are required for projects. I know a, a big player in Africa, for example, Gajoba. Uh, they're headquartered in Wuhan, so clearly they they they're in they're in having difficult navi- uh, difficult waters to navigate. Um, so 
you've got projects that could be delayed, you've got imports that are likely to be delayed. Um, in terms of China's exports, um, you know, most of them are low-cost manufactured goods, um, and you would have covered that last week in the in the in the in the podcast. But you know, EWU, for example, five six percent of Africa's export or Africa's purchases from China come from EWU, and EWU is basically at a standstill now. If you widen that to a number of broader ports that are operating at 30%, 40% capacity and are likely to continue to for the next couple of weeks, you've got quite a significant hit uh, to flows between China and Africa. You know, kind of just, just as, as you mentioned that uh, so, some of these danger um, factors have, were already apparent before the outbreak. Um, how well prepared do you feel African governments were in, in dealing with this? Um, you know, did, did, they, did they anticipate that there was some kind of big disruptor could possibly come and did they have any kind of ideas in place about how to deal with it? To be frank, I don't think so. Um, so the forums that I participate in and the conversations that I have with African leaders that generally come to China, um, they always struck, I, I always try and um, stress to them that the change in China's economy that has been ongoing for the last couple of years, um, led by Xi Jinping and Liu He and the administration that are focusing on de-risking the economy and changing behavior of the financial system and reducing the reliance on fixed asset investments and credit booms. Uh, you know, that reality that's real and that you see um, genuine progress being made hasn't really been widely understood by uh, the African uh, leadership and African businesses. You know, the amount of people that are still, you know, seeing China as a place to buy raw materials connected to, you know, building roads, bridges and ports is, is surprises me. And I think it lacks, it shows the lack of understanding of what's really driving China's economy and what the plan is for China's economy over the next five to 10 years. The point that you know, uh, China builds eight, nine trillion renminbi worth of, of dollars worth of fixed asset investment each year, that a third of that comes from manufacturing. Most of that's private owned firms that are connected to exports. The, the fact that they were going through such a difficult environment last year really didn't seem to interest um, some of my um, colleagues in Africa. That surprised me. The reality is that all of, all of the people offshore assume that as soon as China's GDP growth slows, they'll just stimulate through using credit and build more infrastructure. And they've shown pretty clearly, I mean, sure, they've done some of that over the last two years, but the, even in the sort of fight with the trade war and the difficulties that the private companies were f finding themselves in, they didn't really backtrack on, on their overarching medium and long-term goal. Now, the question now is, does the coronavirus trigger um, either a pause or a fundamental backtrack in that process. Now, at, at the start of the coronavirus, if you'd asked me early February, I would have said, absolutely, they've gone, you know, uh, all hands on deck, uh, let's support the economy now and deal with the consequences later. But, you know, as and, and, and at that time, the NDRC was saying, you know, yes, we're going to fast track projects. Uh, we saw the local government bond issuance quota uh, doubled for March. But actually, when you look at the detail, they're focusing on supporting private businesses, which is what they were doing already through the last 18 months. They're trying to make sure that banks are continue to lend to these companies. Yes, some of that defaults and non-performing loans that may come as a result of that are something they're worried about. But even that, they've said to the banks, look, we understand that you're going to run into non-performing loans, but those can be excluded from our macroeconomic, uh, macro prudential assessments. Um, so th there is a balance, that, but generally speaking, it's, you know, we'll cut taxes if you stop, em if you continue to employ people, we'll reduce bureaucratic red tape, we'll make sure that the cost of doing business is cheaper. They're even talking about like uh, the unemployment insurance and the social security that you would have paid last year. In some provinces, they're giving the cash back to companies who've made those payments last year to help them. So really, it's it's been about how do we support businesses to stay operational and keep employment stable? Now, obviously, that's not going to be particularly easy. A lot of businesses are in deep trouble. Uh, I've had plenty of conversations with small business owners uh, around China that, you know, are pretty close to, to running into a wall. Uh, but, you know, that's where the policy impulse is. It's not, you know, let's just start building some more roads, bridges and ports. Uh, 
and 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 let's use credit to do that and and so i don't think that africa's side is particularly well prepared for what is a fundamental change in the way that china's economy attaches itself to the rest of the world yeah this is interesting because this talks about the innovation and evolution of african economic growth so we've talked cobus for years about the africa rising narrative but at the end of the day most of what Africa sells to the rest of the world is the same thing that they sold 50 years ago. There's been no real evolution of the outbound product. That is, China buys mostly timber, oil, and minerals. And so, Jeremy, if what you're saying is going to to happen in a more expedited manner because of the coronavirus, that it's going to reduce the amount of timber, oil, and minerals that it's going to buy because the Chinese economy is turning more into a services economy like what we have in the United States and other advanced economies and less a manufacturing economy, then African economies are going to be maybe stuck holding the bag because it's one thing to have oil at $100 a barrel. It's another thing to have it at 50 or 45. And so I'm kind of curious about if your clients aren't picking up on this message or you're, the people you're speaking with aren't picking up on the messages and the change in the Chinese economy, what are the consequences for those African companies and countries that don't evolve? Well, they, I mean, that, that, so, so it would, the guys that are, are sort of selling the, the, the coal, the steel, the iron or whatever it may be, they, they're very tuned into what's going on in China and, and they have – you know, first world research, or they have you know partners on the ground in China, uh, and they they focus predominantly and rightly so on the supply adjustments that are coming out of China. So, the environmental policies, for example, the carving out capacity, that's where they are. But wh- when it comes to traders, as in the equity market traders, the currency traders, the funds, the asset managers, they're the ones that I think often are are thinking of China in, in a way of, in, in a slightly jaded way, uh, not a very nuanced way. And they think at the end of the day, it's a centrally planned economy. And if, you know, if growth falls to five, they'll stimulate and they'll do it through traditional levers. Now, the point I've continued to made over the last couple of years is that those traditional levers are far less potent than they used to be. Um, the debt levels pre- pre- present a relatively formidable challenge to repeating those kinds of um, p- plays from their old traditional playbook. And the financial system is already under significant stress. Um, we know last year, for example, six smallish banks uh, went bust. We know that the, the regulators update, updated bank bankruptcy laws. We know that they're going to be takeovers, uh, M&As, there's going to be bank recapitalization. All of that was always going to happen this year. And now with non-performing loans rising uh, and defaults rising and stress rising and, and bad debts generally rising. I mean, the reality is the PBOC had a stress test at the end of last year where they pe- penned in 4.15% growth for 2020. And they had a five times increase in non-performing loan ratios across the banking sector. So if growth falls to 4.5%, 5%, which I expect it to, you are going to see significant stress in the financial system. And that's why one of the reasons why I'd argue that the you know, this this ability for the Chinese economy to rebound and then stabilize and, you know, basically grow at five and a half percent, even though the coronavirus has hit, it just doesn't make any sense, uh, given that these stresses are going to materialize and for- cause headwinds in the second half of this year. But, you know, where I'm thinking there might be an opportunity for Africa is that if these supply chains are disrupted fundamentally, there, there might be a question for Chinese exporters to start saying, well, maybe we should be looking at being closer to our market. And some of their fastest growing markets continue to be and have been for the last five years, Africa. And so perhaps uh, if Africa can pitch itself right, um, it could be able to attract more inbound investment in manufacturing capacity. But to do that, Africa needs to be far more forceful and single-minded in prioritizing tactics for further industrialization. Um, And Chinese investment can certainly help. We've seen that in Ethiopia. We've seen that Chinese companies have gone through that process themselves in the 80s using special economic zones. But like you said in the question, I mean, unfortunately, unlike Asian economies whose rising incomes have been associated with a structural shift from agriculture to industry, African countries have tended to bypass manufacturing and therefore Africa's growth hasn't been labor absorptive to allow an upward income migration of the population. And so we kind of need to focus on manufacturing and to do that, 
um, you know, we could use Chinese help. But until we do that, you know, in reality, Chinese products are pre pre preventing many African countries from uh, building manufacturing capacity. And that's no fault of the Chinese, but that's the reality. That's really the uh, question that I would like to, you know, kind of to focus on more a little bit. Because, you know, in, in the case of South Africa, for example, um, you know, that South Africa has, you know, compared to the rest of Africa, South Africa has, has a certain amount of manufacturing capability uh, already. But a lot of that has declined due to Chinese imports. Um, so if you were speaking to, to African policymakers now, um, what would be the top three things you would, you would tell them, you know, uh, that they should do in order to grab this opportunity to kind of move some of that manufacturing to Africa? It's a good question, and you're right. South Africa um, is a good cho choice or potential for, um, for supporting some kind of uh, African manufacturing renaissance. Um, our own political and socioeconomic difficulties haven't really helped, but Chinese penetration certainly has displaced imports uh, from other countries and domestic production. Uh, as you would know, textiles, clothing, footwear and so on have all battled um, with increased competition. Um, but with our unemployment as it is, I would, I would strongly argue that um, the leadership inside South Africa has to basically be transparent about exactly what it wants from, from the Chinese relationship. And it needs to say our definition of win-win is a certain amount of jobs created, a certain amount of skill upgrading and tech transfer. Um, and we want you know, support from China to that end. And we're going to evaluate whether or not this partnership is working for us based on that criteria. And if you were to give China that clear objective, uh, I think that that would probably be something they would welcome because you know, one of the issues that the Chinese side have, generally speaking, when it comes to, uh, you know, the FOCAC forums and so on, is that they have a relatively clear vision about what exactly they're trying to achieve from the relationship. But what we don't have is an African answer. And I think that if you ask me, not only would I then put jobs at the forefront of that conversation, I would, I would have policy coordination um, within regions in Africa that were far more clear, um, far more um, uh, obvious and, and negotiated between the African governments so that d policy coordination was something that they had when they engaged with Africa, uh, with the Chinese side. Um, so I think generally speaking, I mean, of course, there's tariff barriers. We've got this new free trade zone that we've prom we're promoting. Progress will be made. We need infrastructure to facilitate intra-Africa trade. You know, there's, there are plenty of reasons why. I mean, Africa basically produces stuff that we don't buy and we buy stuff that we don't make. And we need to, f to find a way to resolve that. And my argument is that China could be an, an important ally in um, that process. But African governments would need to sort of do the hard yards amongst themselves so that when they come to China, they're not just representing themselves, they're representing... An, an African view or a, or a regional view. And, and so I'm, I've made the case many times that, you know, South Africa's most important partner isn't China, for example. It's Nigeria and it's Kenya. And, and that the government and foreign policy needs to recognize that those are the partnerships that matter most. Now, China's going to continue to sell things to Africa. And the choice becomes to South Africa, for example, as an example, do you want to participate in intra-Africa trade or not? Because if you don't want to participate in intra-Africa trade, then you can carry on like you're doing. And in reality, when you look at not only China's imports from the rest of the world, I mean, South Africa in 2013 was China's th 12th largest trading partner for imports. And now it's out of the top 20. So, of course, that speaks to that structural dynamic where China's buying less stuff um, from African countries and less commodities uh, relatively to other things. But, you know... I would argue that, that inside our region, inside South Africa's region, uh, we're becoming less important to our, our partners and our partners are increasingly trading more and more with China. And so we have to find a way to reverse that process and participate in a rise in intra-Africa trade. And I think that uh, the Chinese side would 
potentially be open to a negotiation that started at, in that vein. And so I, that would be clearly what I would focus on. Let's turn our attention to debt here. And Cobus alluded to this at the top of the show about a lot of debt that the China, that Africans owe China is tied up in resources. So they made a deal at oil being at $85 a barrel or $100 a barrel, whatever it is. And now that it's at $50 a barrel, the value of that debt changes quite a bit. A number of African countries are starting to face some degree of debt distress. This is a highly sensitive topic. Uh, The African Development Bank and African leaders will tell you they are managing their debts quite well. But when we look at the debt-to-GDP ratios, they are moving up above 50%. Ghana is pushing its debt levels higher. Zambia now is uh, having difficulties paying some Chinese contractors So the fluctuations in China are going to have an impact on debt sustainability in Africa. Uh, What's your sense as to whether or not the Chinese will tolerate a default of some kind? And will they come in, in your opinion, to rescue because there are political implications with a debt default in Africa? Uh, Or will they collect on that debt and let the markets take their course? What's your thought on debt? Mm, a good question. I, look, it might be naive, but uh, you know, when I, when I talk to clients and b- the big SOEs here and their engagements with Africa and their plans for Africa and how they're tolerating the coronavirus and what are the implications, uh, you know, most of them are very dedicated to making sure that they f- fulfill their commitments to Africa. Now, as I say, this might be naive and it might be sort of me just buying the the Kool Aid, but. I don't see much evidence of China being malicious in their management of difficulties when it comes to China-Africa relationships. So when it comes to debt sustainability, I would argue that the reality is most of the Chinese uh, lenders would renegotiate the terms, they would probably delay repayments, they would probably give grace periods, they would probably do a lot to prevent the um, narrative being that China's come in and and nationalized stuff or taken over ports or, you know, done the things that they get accused of regularly in the international media. So I think that they would trade quite carefully. Your broader point about where Africa is in, in this debt cycle, that's a more worrying topic in my opinion. Um, we have seen significant um, resurgence in debt levels across many African countries. Um, it has caught the attention of global media, and not recently, but you know the last couple of years, particularly last year. Um, some countries were running into trouble, uh, like you've mentioned, Zambia, for example, Ghana, for example. Um, if China's GDP was to surprise, like I'm thinking, to the downside, and if the global recovery was unlikely to take shape like people had thought. So, for example, the IMF, I think, have a global growth forecast of 3.4% for this year, slight acceleration from last year. You know, we're thinking, you know, if China does what we think it's going to do, global growth could be 2.5%. And that has, you know, clearly cut the legs off any global manufacturing resurgence that people were expecting. That hit to global sentiment will hurt emerging market assets materially, commodity prices, Uh, currencies and so on. And so Africa does run the risk of running into funding problems and liquidity problems. And the reality is, and the warning has been out there for some time, it's great that you're raising more commercial sources of debt, uh, but the implication of that is that you're more vulnerable to fluctuations in yields and interest rates and so on. Um, So there's a vulnerability there. Um, We're watching a number of African countries carefully, obviously, um, but then you th- you have to then counterweight that with you know the structural drivers that are driving Africa's economic activity aren't going to be derailed in the near term, and clearly urbanization, industrialization, modernization, technological leapfrogging, um, you know financial deepening, uh, rising middle class, all of those things are well entrenched. They are real. They do matter, and they continue to matter. And that's really where not only myself as an analyst, but you know Standard Bank as a group do focus uh, their attention. And then it's about navigating these these difficult times. And I would argue that China recognizes that just as well as I do, and they're more likely to be quite, um, quite uh, accommodative 
in how they handle uh, Africa's debt. Do you have a, an impression so far of how the crisis is going to affect the Belt and Road Initiative? Um, you know, and and where it where where the Belt and Road Initiative was before the outbreak and where it stands now. So, my view on the Belt and Road Initiative is that part of the internal fluctuations and dynamics that we've spoken about at play inside the Chinese economy uh, have resulted in China recognizing that they need different sources of um, markets for their products, uh, for their low-cost manufactured goods. They need a place to build more roads, bridges and ports uh, where their engineering and construction companies have become incredibly globally competitive. Um, and so building the infrastructure that connects to Asia uh, to China more, you know, uh, unfettered uh, helps them uh, and, ac- and allows them to access markets. And there is a rising middle class and those structural dynamics that I've spoken about in Africa exist in Asia. I would argue that Wombel Road is basically what China's been doing in Africa since 2000, but in its geography, in its neighborhood. And, and, and when it comes to Africa and the Belt and Road, sure, it touches pockets of Africa, but I, do, I actually think that it's counterproductive for African countries to declare themselves members of Belt and Road. It's fine to be a supporter of Belt and Road and the initiative, but you know, I think it kind of misses the point. What China wants from Africa is Africa to have its own plans and its own vision for what it, it wants to look like in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and to bring that to the negotiating table. I actually don't think it serves us well if if some unnamed West African country decides that it's going to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative because it's really just another way of them saying we don't really have a plan for our relationship with China. Anyway, but the the Belt and Road Initiative is obviously Xi Jinping's you know global foreign policy initiative that matters and it's sort of uh, uh, returning China to its hegemonic position in Asia and it has a lot of commercial benefits uh, for its firms and helps it, the country sort of deal with some of the uh, imbalances in economic activity that happen inland versus the coastal regions by connecting some of these inland areas with a uh, regional market inside Asia. So uh, that's really what I think the rationale for it was and always has been. Uh, we saw 2013, 14, 15, I think that the, around about that time, there was a big a rush to get um, capital out and lend for projects related to Belt and Road. There's been quite a significant pullback in the last couple of years linked to this de-risking of the domestic economy and the financial system because you can't tell you know, big banks here in China, look, you've got to be careful how you lend money domestically, but checkbook diplomacy is fine internationally. And we've seen that in, in their relationships with Africa that have been a little bit more conservative in their forecast, but it's also come into play in the Belt and Road Initiative. And so they've been more careful in how they allocate capital, and they've been quite, they've been trying quite hard over the last year or two to um, to get an idea of exactly wh- where, where money's been lent and what it's been for and what are the commercial viabilities of those projects. So the, the, the entire thing has really been put on ice to some extent uh, whilst they come to terms with what's been done so far. The coronavirus um, is unlikely to fundamentally alter the status quo. Uh, I would guess that, that if anything, um, it's, it's, it's the same as what, what I said about Africa. It, potentially the supply chains are disrupted, potentially projects are delayed. Um, you know, the, there's, a, there's attention is going to be diverted domestically, obviously, uh, at this time. Financial institutions and the big sort of policy banks are going to be focused on supporting um, near-term growth inside China and helping alleviate, alleviate um, the tensions and difficulties for small businesses and so on. So it will just be sort of pushed to the background. But I don't think it fundamentally changes the, the narrative of Belt and Road. Jeremy Stevens is the China economist for Standard Bank. Uh, is that still Africa's largest bank? They like yeah, to say yeah. that it's Africa's largest bank. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Africa's largest bank. It might be a, a, a sort of dodgy definitional issue because I think we're the biggest bank by assets. But then there's probably other banks that are bigger based on something else. Okay, but at least bigger, biggest number one by assets. We'll give you that number one title. Uh, joining us from the tropics of Sanya on Hainan Island in southern China, where you are 
quarantined in paradise, which is really an awful thing to be. We hope that you and your family uh, are all safe. You produce a fantastic newsletter. Uh, if people want to get your newsletter about uh, China economics and the, and the macroeconomic picture in China, what's the best way for them to, to sign up? So, yes. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that, because last time I did this podcast, I got a flurry of requests. So that's great news. Uh, yes, just email me. It's jeremy.stevens at standardsbg.com. And once you email me, I'll get you on the mailing list and I'll, I'll, I'll in the same way I can answer questions that you may have uh, pertaining to things discussed or other things. Fantastic. Uh, so I'll put the link to, to Jeremy's email in our show notes so if you want to sign up for that newsletter. It's really essential reading. It's all about the China macroeconomic. But it goes to the point, Jeremy, that you were talking about in terms of educating African stakeholders about what's happening in China. And this is really one of the best resources to do it. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Again, we, we wish you the best and hope that you, uh, again, stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, both of you. <music> Cobus, my big takeaway from the conversation with Jeremy is that Af African stakeholders are, again, not sufficiently briefed and educated about what's happening in China. So just like we talked about in the earlier part of the show, which was for the past 50 years, African exports really haven't evolved beyond raw material and extractive products. And, and, and it's just the world is so different today, though. That might have been acceptable in the 1970s. But today, things are moving so fast, and the idea that they're so dependent on the China market, and now the China market really doesn't want what they have to sell, what is going to happen? And they're not understanding you know, what's happening inside China and the Chinese history, politics, culture, economics to be able to adapt quickly enough. And, you know, I mean, who, who's to blame here at the end of the day? I mean, there's, you know, there's plenty of time here for people to get educated. Plenty of time. This was not, this should not be a surprise. We knew this day was coming that China was going to, at some point, evolve its economy away from raw materials. And it may be the coronavirus is going to be the thing that just expedites that. And so many African countries are going to be left holding the bag. And it's going to be really hard to feel sorry for them. It's really dismaying. Um, and, you know, but, but we see at the same time that, that African governments very frequently just don't challenge themselves. To, to, to be prepared in this kind of way. You know, it's, it's not only that the, the, the long-term evolution of the Chinese economy, it's also the fact that, that these kind of health crises have had, there's, there's been very strong precedence for them in China in the past. You know, like anyone who looks at China, even for even briefly knows that this is a recurring thing that, that China has to deal with. Um, and there seems to be very little prepared preparedness in, in Africa for it. Um, and, you know, it, it raises so many questions about, about the, the, the nature of economic planning in Africa and, and why. The, the, this is the biggest question. This is a question that Africans ask all the time, is, is, why, is Af why is Africa still stuck in this commodity cycle when people in the 50s were already pointing out that it's such a damaging and ultimately unprofitable place for Africa to be. It's the, the worst possible way of dealing with, with all of Africa's um, resource riches is just kind of selling it for cheap on the international market, you know, kind of an, essentially giving it away in, in its raw form. Um, and then importing the, the finished products again. You know, it's, it's, it was terrible in the 50s. It's terrible now. You know, people have been pointing it out for decades. I don't know why it hasn't changed. I don't get the sense of urgency in Africa today about what is coming. Uh, and again, I'm very far away. So admittedly, I'm looking at the media coverage of this very closely and social media vibe. I'm not picking up on the alarm that I think people in most African countries should have. Uh, the refining of, of African oil has dropped by 20% in the past month. I mean, it's been a precipitous drop. The, the share of some of the diamond companies have fallen 20, 30 uh, percent. South African construction companies are having difficulty importing cement. Agricultural products are, are going to have a much more difficult time competing in this market. It's, it's going to touch so many different ways. And then let's not even talk about the currencies. So your currency, Cobus, the RAND, is going up and down based on what's happening in China. And I just don't get the sense of urgency. And that is a surprise to me. And it's also the same thing that 
that Jeremy was saying when he's talking to his clients. They're, yeah, they're not worried. And I get there's, there's this sense, maybe a false sense of security because everybody wants to have their Africa summits. The Turks won an Africa summit. Russia had an Africa summit. The US has prosper Africa. But none of them are really bringing a lot of cash to the table. You were in Yokohama last year and they're talking about private sector engagement. Well, I'll tell you, in the downturn, the first people to run are going to be the private sector companies. That is for sure. <laughs> so if you have a private sector-led strategy and the economy turns south in Africa and the ability to make money from that engagement is gone, then kiss that strategy goodbye. They are going to be the first to run, right? Yes, no, you're completely right, and and I think I, I also completely agree with Jeremy that that these African countries should be factoring each other into their future strategies a lot more than they are. You know, um, as he said, you know, South Africa should be looking at Nigeria as a, as a partner and as a, a kind of a. A, 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 a kind of a lodestar for its future economic planning, um, especially in the context of the of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. But we also we also know that one of the the, the countries that have the, that have been the most wary of joining the free trade agreement has been Nigeria. And, you know, kind of the, the larger the economies were, the, the warier they were of, of, of getting into the free trade agreement, which raises a lot of questions about, you know, kind of how this kind of integrated African economic planning is going to work. The question of, of, of where South Africa should buy its cement is from Nigeria. You know, Nigeria is a big cement producer. Um, or then, you know, it had it has it has companies that, that produce a lot of cement. Why South Africa why that isn't already in happening? Yeah, but buying cement from Nigeria it means transporting it all the way across the continent and it's probably cheaper and easier to bring it in from somewhere else overseas. I mean, the logistics just aren't there to transport it. But this was a point that was brought up by Aubrey Ruby, and I'd like to get your take on this. Aubrey Ruby, of course, the senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. And I was at a lecture of hers where she pointed out the fact that too much of what Africa sells is not differentiated from one country to the next. So Rwanda is not going to sell Kenya coffee. I mean, that's the reality is that too many African countries actually sell the same thing. So all this hype about intra-Africa trade sounds great. But there's only so much oil, timber, coffee, you know, you know, cement, these things. You have to have product differentiation in order to generate demand and trade. And we haven't seen that diversification yet in, 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 enough to generate the kind of boom that people really want. And that's, again, poor economic planning. Exactly. And as, as Anzetse Wary has pointed out to us in the past, is what you find when, when African countries are, face greater economic integration and, and, and are starting to plan to export more stuff to China is that they all hone in on the same sector and they all produce the same product, um, you know, in competition with each other. You know, so it's that, that itself is extremely problematic and difficult. And that's, again, another thing to look at Asia where there is a lot more diversification. So Southeast Asia sells a lot more agriculture. Northeast Asia sells technology. Japan sells services. There is a lot of variety here in what people are selling to one another. And I think in that case, it would be incumbent on the African Union. And this is where a regional group does help to be able to help guide different countries to better specialize to their strengths rather than everybody selling coffee, timber, oil and minerals. So we're, we're coming up to some, rain, to some very, very dark rain clouds. And it just, honestly, I don't see people really being that worried. And I think they should be terrified. Um, so on that depressing note, <laughs> we usually don't like to end on a depressing note, but today we're going to do it. You know, we talked about Jeremy's newsletter to help educate stakeholders. We, too, produce a similar newsletter. Jeremy's a subscriber. Uh, some of the banks in South Africa are subscribers. We've got uh, folks in Beijing, in Washington, in Brussels, uh, all over the world in the major capitals. They're reading what we write every day, in part to be able to get ahead of some of these trends. And we are dissecting the news, every piece of granular news that you can get. It's really the opposite of an academic paper on China, Africa, where they take the big picture, it's slow cooked. We are doing the micro picture, hour to hour, day to day, tweet to tweet. And so if this is what you are trying to stay on top of, then you definitely want to subscribe. Go to our website, chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. It's $149, not a lot of money. We feel it's a fair price uh, for what we do. And there's a half off 
for students and academics at just $75 or $7 a month. So we would love to have you part of our growing community of readers. Uh, and uh, um, plus, when you subscribe, you get the chance to interact a lot more with Copus and I. So that's always a nice little bonus. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Copus and I will be back again next week with another show. Until then, for Copus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Quobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.